Hi, I think I was just talking while I was muted. I thought I clicked it, sorry. I wanted to welcome everybody. My name is Susan Kornfeld and uh, welcome to our February 7th plant clinic. Last year at this time, we would have been meeting at the beautiful um, Arboretum under the Rose Arbor, but it's also nice to get together under the comforts of our own home. So next slide, please. We have a wonderful group of Master Gardener panelists today to answer garden questions, some of which we received in advance and some of which I hope that uh, you will give us. We might also indulge in some general plant chat. I'd like to have each of the panelists introduce themselves to you. So let's start with Cindy Bergdorf. Good morning, Cindy. Unmute, Cindy. Uh, I'm a master gardener um, since 2008. I live in the hot part of San Mateo County. I live in Atherton. Um, I do a lot of vegetable gardening. I usually plant about 25 tomato bushes every year. I like to um, can them as well as dry tomatoes and eat them fresh. And I enjoy native plant gardening and particularly my pollinator garden. I'd like to introduce you next to Cindy Morris. Hi, I'm Cindy Morris. Um, I've been a master gardener since 2010. Um, I um, enjoy lecturing about herbs, houseplants, orchids, propagation, and um, love um, nature in my backyard. And now I'd like to pass it on to Jonathan Propp. I'm Jonathan Propp. I'm also from the class of 2008, and um, I live in the slightly less hot part of San Mateo County in Menlo Park, closer to the bay. Um, I like to do organic fruit and vegetable gardening. And now I'd like to introduce Betsy Shelton. Hi, I'm Betsy Shelton. I uh, also was from the class of 2008, and uh, I live in Half Moon Bay, so I live in one of the cool, foggy coastal parts of San Mateo County. And currently my favorite plants are camellias and wisteria. So now I'm handing it back to Susan. Unmute. Unmute. Okay, so I see this is an issue for me. At any rate, I was a class of 2016. I'm a professional gardener and I like to write gardening articles and I love to read gardening books. And we do have a club that focuses on that. So stay tuned for that information. Uh, okay, next slide, please. I guess before we actually get into discussing the questions though, I want to mention that we, that we are taking questions on our chat list down below. We have Master Gardener, Monica Martin, who will be our chat box coordinator. So she'll be keeping her eye out for your questions. I'd like her to introduce herself too, before we get started. Hi, I'm Monica Martin. I live in San Francisco and I've been a Master Gardener since 2018. For the last couple of years, I have uh, been planting California native wildflowers and other annuals that seem to be happy to reseed themselves in my garden. So my favorite thing right now is watching them start to pop up all over. <laughs> That's great. Okay, our first question comes from someone who has roses. I have a vintage gardens Phyllis Bide, 20 year old rose, and a hot cocoa, 10 year old rose. What is around the base, and what should I do? Well, um, this is a fungal problem. Um, you have conchs, you have um, galls. Um, if, if you look at the other picture, that round, um, yeah, the round one above it. Yes, that is a conch. And below, I mean, I'm sorry, that's a gall. And if you look below, that's probably a conch. Um, what interests me about this is, I don't know if these two plants are close together or not, because fungal um, disease runs underground and it can be long stems of fungal growth. So I wonder if these are next to each other and the fungal is traveling underground to different plants in her garden. Um, 
because that could be quite uh, devastating. Betsy, yeah. did you want to add something? Well, I did, you know, the lovely thing is that this was submitted in advance. And so um, I had a chance to do a little research to learn for myself something about it. And I checked in with a master gardener who is a rosarian, a, a consulting rosarian, uh, Stu Dalton. And he confirmed that he, he also thinks that the picture on the left is a fungal growth of some kind and that the picture on the right is a crown gall which he tells me is bacterial. So one's fungal and one's bacterial. It's a little hard to tell, but they're both soil-borne pathogens. So the answer, you know, the, 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 the thing to pay attention to in both cases is that the pathogen that's causing these is in the soil. Mm -hmm. And so you have to decide whether you wanna to try to do something short-term, uh, understanding that long-term, you're not really gonna be able to solve the problem for that plant because it's in the soil. Um, Stu did have some links, he shared some links, which I believe have been shared in the chat that are resources for people um, to look at about those things. And ultimately you may wanna remove some of the soil around the plant and put some fresh soil in, but it's not gonna get rid of the pathogen that's in all of the soil. No, and I would think um, because it travels underground in the soil, they could move to other plants. Mm -hmm. If they're weakened or, you know, if you have a weakened plant, it could move in. So probably best to dispose of these plants and, and uh, maybe put some fresh soil. And sometimes I hear people can very carefully remove the, the conks, which are on the left side, without harming the bark though. But yes, and if it's, that's a pretty sophisticated, pretty, big fruiting of the of the fungus there so it's that's, probably a goner that's a result of a bigger problem which is the tree the roots of the tree are rotting yeah um and this is just telling you that's what's happening so if you remove it it doesn't solve the roots right um, rotting so um so you may want to think in terms of looking for, if you want to plant new plants in that area, you might want to pay attention to looking for plants that specify that they're resistant to the fungus or the, the bacterium that, that is the pathogen in the soil. I think there are some roses and some other plants where you can see on the label that they'll tell you they're resistant to certain pathogens in the soil. I have a, had a, a, a loquat tree that had this and I cut the loaf and it died and I cut it down. And I noticed that there's a uh, growth coming out of the roots under the ground. So it's still there. Yeah. Even though the tree's gone. That's okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, I have a six-year-old Nagami kumquat that is growing in a container. Why are its leaves yellow? And I have to say, this is one of the most common questions we get as master gardeners. Why are the leaves yellow? And it's the reason I became a master gardener. I wanted to learn why leaves turn yellow. So who wants to take a stab at uh, this particular case? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, um, partly because I'm particularly interested in container gardening. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that um, woody plants, trees like a citrus tree, citrus are perfectly willing to, small citrus plants are perfectly willing to grow in a container, but they need to be periodically taken out of the container and repotted with some fresh soil. So this questioner doesn't say, they say it's a six-year-old kumquat, they don't say whether they've ever actually taken it out of the pot and repotted it. With citrus, um, because it's a heavy feeder, uh, you, it needs to be fertilized pretty regularly. And this, this particular yellow type of marking where you see the veins very green, and it's the yellow around the green veins is um, often, indicative of a nut nutrient deficiency in the soil. Um, and because it's in a container that reinforces the likelihood that the, the plant is not getting everything it needs. So, and with citrus in pots, they really need to be taken out and repotted every two to three years at the most. Um, and I think, uh, so look for some good information about uh, repotting containers, repotting trees and uh, nu nutrient issues for citrus. 
Would adding compost to this um, tree help it? If it's in a container, can you add compost um, to keep the soil alive? Would that be helpful? Um, it would be helpful, but it's still really, especially for citrus, it really needs to be taken out of the container at least every two to three years. And then you can either, um, if you want to put it back in the same size container, you can root prune it, cut back the roots maybe an inch or an inch and a half all around the edge and an inch and a half or two at the bottom, and then put fresh soil in the container at the bottom and put replant the root ball and pack new fresh soil around the edges. Um, or if you want, you can move it up to a bigger container that gives you a couple of inches at the bottom and an inch or so around the edges to put fresh soil in either one. But um, it's, it, it's just adding compost will not be enough unless you also repot it every two, three years. I know that this particular pattern of veination with a with the dark veins and the yellow in between is commonly said to be to indicate an iron deficiency, but there are other nutrient deficiencies that result in the very same pattern. So don't just go adding iron. Um, use the the citrus fertilizers are uh, are pretty balanced for citrus needs. So in between the the repotting, you know, do follow the um, the fertilizer. Uh, specifications on the citrus package. Yeah. Also, the citrus fertilizers help keep the soil more um, acidic, which citrus needs. And when they can't take up the nutrients that are in the soil, if the soil becomes base, basic and loses its acidity, then it blocks the plant from being able to take up the nutrients that are in the soil. So a fertilizer that's specific to citrus is really helpful for all that all of citrus's particular needs. Okay, next slide. I inherited a beautiful blueberry plant from a friend when she moved away. This year, the leaves are discolored. Can you tell me what it is and what to do to get rid of it? It is in a half wine barrel. Okay. So, Susan, this is Jonathan. Um, yeah, I, I, I looked this up and um, it looks like it's probably some, it's, there's something called blueberry spot, leaf spot, and um, it's a fungal disease, um, which, which means it's in the soil. Um, so again, similar to the question about the rose, you've got to remove the blueberry from the soil. And, and since it's in a, a wine barrel and not in the ground, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can um, remove it and um, put it in fresh soil. And I would dispose of that old soil because it's, it's probably got the fungus in there. Um, and, and is there anybody else who has thoughts on this? No, I agree. Um, yeah. I, also, I also did a little research and found um, also, I, I agree that it's a fungal problem. And one of the clues is that the lesions in the leaves are m mostly circular. And often when the, when the lesions in the leaves are circular, that's a clue that it's likely to be fungal. But there is a fungus that affects blueberries called double spot, which I learned from researching this. I didn't know this off the top of my head. But there is a blueberry, a fungus that affects blueberries that's called double spot. Um, and actually the, the main recommendation for taking, for dealing with double spot in blueberries boils down to sanitation and pruning and giving the plant the conditions that it, that it needs to be optimal. Uh, um, and pruning, it, it's valuable to prune blueberries once a year. And this is about the right time of year to prune them. And then because those leaves have the fungus, I would clean them up, not leave them on the soil, bag them up and throw them away. I wouldn't compost them. And, um, but I think if you prune it once a year so it gets better airflow and you make sure it's getting all the sunlight it needs um, and all the nutrients and moisture it needs in the soil, the plant itself will defend itself from that if it's given all the perfect conditions. Okay, that's good. And, you know, and along with that, pull off all the affected leaves. I, it might be picky work, yeah. but, you know, pick, pick them off the plant as well as off the soil as well. Yeah. Sanitation. Okay, um, this, is, next, this is Monica. I just wanted to uh, 
note for participants that we've posted in the chat uh, information on uh, the blueberries, uh, information about citrus, and wood decay, referring to the first slide. Okay. And also to remind participants, please uh, feel free to post any gardening questions you have. We don't have any questions from you yet. Um, right. Yeah, we welcome that. That's what the clinic part is all about. So I, I, I'd just like to make one additional point on, on the blueberry. Um, it's important to know that blueberries are unlike um, most of the fruits we grow in that they like an acid soil. Um, so that's lower on the pH scale. Um, blueberries thrive in places where there are a lot of um, um, evergreen trees <laughs> like the Pacific Northwest and, and New England. Um, <clears throat> and, and those make the soil more acidic. Blueberries are not, you know, don't naturally do well in, in our area. Our soil is a little more alkaline. Um, so that the point simply is, since you've got it in, in a wine barrel anyhow, you don't need to worry about the soil being alkaline. But the main point is it wants an, an acid type of fertilizer, um, un, unlike other fruit fruits. <clears throat> okay, um, next slide, please. All right, white spots have appeared on our orange tree. It is a well-established tree and seems otherwise in good health. What is happening and do I need to do anything? So we can see all those blotchy white things um, on that tree. They look a lot to me like lichens. Does anybody else have some thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I agree. It looks to me like lichen. There's a stage in the development of lichen when it's very when it just kind of looks like a like a patch of white like that and then over time it develops more three-dimensional characteristics um so that that would be my guess as well um and lichen is not a problem for the tree it doesn't it doesn't parasitize the tree it doesn't take anything from the tree or do any damage to the tree so um it's 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 not something to worry about. I think lichen is very cool to look at and I enjoy seeing it. The good thing about lichen is it indicates that this tree is in a place where there's good air quality because lichen are very sensitive to that. So it's a positive sign and uh, perhaps over time those white blotches will become more um, attractive with some fully fruiting lichen on it. It's a good sign. We've got a question from John panelists uh, and it is, are there any plants, especially natives, that would have a chance close to, but not under, large established eucalyptus trees? Um, well, until, until we got to the eucalyptus part, I could think of a bunch of them, but <laughs> eucalyptus are a little harder to grow things under. You could certainly try ferns. Um, that would be uh, maybe um, yerba buena mint might work. That's a native. I've seen, I have seen nasturtium growing around, um, going Just, quite happily around eucalyptus. Nasturtiums? Nasturtiums, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But I know that we're speaking of ferns and- in, in They're our, not natives, but- in, in, uh, But he what? said especially not only natives. Mm -hmm. Oh, especially native. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I know that, that in Australia, you do see uh, lots of ferns under them and some other odd um, Australian plants that I can't, couldn't name them. Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> another, other plants that would grow well in the shade would be something like uh, ceanothus, but I don't know how they react to the eucalyptus. Or you could try Doug Iris. Um, Douglas iris, I, yeah. I don't know how they would react to eucalyptus. I think they'd be okay. Um, I, I would start with ferns um, and I would start with uh, uh, ferns that like a drier climate. The Western sword fern. Yes. Um, 
because um, it's an Australian tree. It comes from a dry area, so I would uh, the uh, I would try it. I would try the Douglas or the um, sword fern first, or the chain fern, or something like that. Yeah, and also I think uh, he mentioned he knows not right under the tree, but more sort of around like on the outside, I'm guessing he means on the outside of the drip line of the tree, meaning essentially just outside the ring that that the canopy of the tree makes. Um, it, you don't, it, you're not likely to have success with anything that's too close to the trunk of the tree because there's too much root competition there. Uh, besides the, the fact that eucalyptus does is sort of it has this allelopathic characteristic that kind of discourages other plants to be too close to it. Um, so, but I will also say the Western Garden Book, the Sunset Western Garden Book, has a page specifically about that helps you identify plants that um, are happy to live in dry shade, which is as Cindy pointed out, you may need to look for things that are willing to be in dry shade. And uh, the Western Garden Book has a list of those. Yeah, and Betsy, John just added, yes, it is in the sun, but subject to the roots and leaves. So that might discourage something like the Doug Iris and possibly even the Western Sword Fern, which has some sun tolerance, but you know, it likes dappled at any rate. Uh, you, might, you might try uh, containers. I have redwood trees in my backyard. And I have a problem with the roots. Uh, the roots love climbing into any containers that I have from the underneath to grab the water. So I put under my pots a piece of slate so that the roots can't get in. And maybe that's something you might want to try. Mm. Um, maybe put ferns or something in pots around the tree um, and just forget putting them directly in the soil. And, uh, and what, ab what about um, succulents? succulents in a pot would work or even just in the ground because you know there's more shallow rooters they can yeah you, you could try i mean yeah. really gardening is just trying <laughs> an experiment yeah, and, the good, just, and the good thing about and see what happens and if it works then buy a bunch of them we, we just got a comment from one of our participants who suggested maybe a campus which also grows well in the shade. I have a canthus in my yard growing under my redwood trees mm -hmm. and it grows very well there. Uh -huh. well, but this situation, he said, he specified has sun. It's mostly like getting in around the roots. So yeah, I'd say just get some four inch plants that you can tuck in around the roots and you know succulents and some of the other things um, that are gonna take some sun and aren't gonna object too much to the eucalyptus uh, leaves. Right. Um, See what happens. Yeah, maybe that maybe a, that pot of blueberry. They like the acidic thing, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the next slide then. Part of our rosemary bush seems to be dying. It is an old bush, but hasn't had problems before. Is there anything I could do, or should I replace it? Well, I think it's probably gone. Um, it, it looks like it's received too much water. Uh, rosemary does not like to have its roots wet. And we were looking at this picture and we, we thought because that citrus is next to it, it would probably being watered that this part of the rosemary was receiving more water than the rosemary above it. And eventually it died. I would take it out and put something in that um, likes a little more water. Yeah. Um, okay. Cindy, um, I, I know you can um, like divide the roots on, on uh, rosemaries. Um, could you just um, separate out the dead part and, and dig down and you know, remove that section of the root and, and see if, uh, if it comes back and leave, leave the good part in there and see if it comes back? You could do that, but if, if the condition is that it's always wet, you're gonna to continue to have problems. Yeah, okay. And so. we were thinking too, looking at that, that there's more than one rosemary. There's not just one long rosemary bush. There's probably a little, originally a little rosemary hedge there. And that might just be one single plant that's dying. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, rosemary is, yeah, they gotta um, treat, treat them like you do your lavenders, which is as little water as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm also always interested when someone has a question like this where they say it hasn't had any, it's been there for a long time, it hasn't had any problems before, and now it's developed a problem. <clears throat> that always makes me curious to know what has changed. And I think it's good to put a, put a little bit of thought into what, what might have changed the conditions if the if those stepping stones are relatively new or if um, a pipe burst recently near there and the plumber had to come and repair it or they got a new dog <laughs> uh, you know sometimes those are useful clues also when it's a change like this mm -hmm. yeah that's a this good point it probably has been struggling and maybe um in a winter rain and a water really pulled up and that was the final straw. I mean, it could be something like that too. Yes, could be. Yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting for the person as they, as they pull up that plant to do a diagnostic on those roots. Absolutely. Are the roots black and soft uh, or eaten away maybe by a rodent <laughs> or do they look sort of healthy in which case something else might've happened an accidental application of herbicide from a neighbor or some other source. So mm -hmm. always check those roots when you dig something up. Uh, next slide, please. I'm trying to figure out what these little brown things are on my Ruby Falls weeping redwood. They pop right off when I touch them and they're dry. Um, you have dead uh, scale. Um, the scale, when it's soft, really soft and it's really like a suction on there. And then it has babies underneath it and they crawl out from under the scale and move off and attach themselves somewhere on the plant. Uh, by the time it's dry, that particular scale plant is, is dead. Um, the a thing scale to do animal. Yeah. Yes. It's an insect. Uh, or like a critter. <laughs> yes. The thing to do um, is to use your fingernail or a paper towel or something and just rub and scrub against that. Um, that branch and get all of the scale that you can off of them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very hard to kill scale with any sort of a spray, which we don't advise anyway, because they're protected by that. That scale is its armor against you and the world. And underneath is where the life happens and crawls out. So you would have to have perfect timing. It's much better just to, to do what Cindy was just saying, just to rub it. And if you get a big outbreak of scale, sometimes they go along the nodes where the, or, or the jointure of, the, of one branch to another. Uh, and they will sap that life out of there. And they can actually take, they can actually kill a bush. I've, I've, I've lost one to scale and, you know, they were just hiding in those little um, crotches of the branches and I hadn't paid attention to it. There's a question regarding scale. Is it an animal or a plant? I think Cindy just reiterated that it's an animal. It's an animal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an insect. 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 Very clever little insects. <laughs> okay, do we have any other questions uh, on the next slide? Let's see. Ah, here we go. A few years ago, my dad added sand to one part of the backyard that I think spread throughout the yard is now mixed with the soil. Does that affect the growth of plants? Where do you recommend getting our soil tested? Well, I guess I can talk to the sand because I live in Half Moon Bay and I, I did a simple soil test, which is just to scoop down about eight inches down and take about a cup or two of soil. And you just put it in a big um, jar of water and you see how it settles out. The sand will settle down first. And then you measure how many inches of sand settled down and how many inches of, of like a mud quality the next size and then the finest silt. And I saw, oh, it's like 70% sand. <laughs> And plants grow very well there, but they don't grow as well as people a few neighborhoods away that have a higher proportion of silt and uh, mud particles in it. So it needs constant water and it actually needs a little fertilizer help because it just goes through the sand so well. But this is sand that was mixed um, in, in a backyard. I suspect there was clay and it was hard and someone thought it'd be good to add sand to it to loosen it up but you know sand plus mud can also equal something closer to, to concrete but it uh, is 
as well as will, will it affect the growth of the plants as long as it hasn't turned concretey and it's just sand and, and mud kind of together, it won't. Um, and just for the sand aspect, I think just a casual test yourself can tell you how much sand you have in it. If you're looking for nutrients and composition of soil, like the, the alkalinity or the acidity, uh, then um, who, where where is our source for information like that? I forget. On our um, website, on the Master Gardener of uh, Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco County's public website, we do have um, a link there on that website to um, sources that, uh, where you could get so have soil tests done. Okay. So, and also, um, I think it's valuable to point out that um, it, you if you're concerned about the texture or um, characteristics of your soil, um, adding compost always helps. Mm -hmm. No matter what soil you're starting with, adding compost is a good answer. Um, so that's helpful. Mm -hmm. right. Add compost and leave the leaves. Those are precious additives to your soil designed by each plant for it to feed its own self. Okay, number two, what veggies do you recommend growing in daily city climate and soil? Um, for all of the participants that are, that are with us from the different areas of San Mateo County, um, I recommend that you go to our website, which is um, Master Gardeners San Mateo, San Francisco. And if you look down the left side of the front page, you'll see, a, you can click on vegetable gardening. And uh, we describe under vegetable gardening, the three major climate zones of San Mateo and San Francisco County, which are hot, sunny, and foggy. Mm -hmm. And if you click on each one of those, you'll see a list of plants that grow well in each of those regions, and also timing for when you should plant those uh, particular vegetables. But just in general, uh, Daly City happens to be more on the foggy end of, uh, of our region. <clears throat> and therefore you don't get a lot of hot sun um, and often you get fog and uh, wind. So things like greens, uh, lettuce, spinach, bok choy, uh, broccoli, uh, cabbage, uh, things like that are going to grow um, better. You probably will have a very hard time growing tomatoes, which need eight hours of hot sun uh, to grow, uh, unless you have a particular corner of your yard that's protected from the wind. Uh, but, but if you go and look on those lists, you can see month by month by month uh, what plants are recommended for your areas in terms of planting. And I think Cindy Morris can also speak to maybe some herbs that would grow well in Daly City. Yes, there are some cool weather herbs um, that only grow in cool weather, and that is parsley and cilantro. Um, unfortunately, our nurseries sell those herbs in the summer when they are easily <laughs> when they easily bolt. They really are cool weather plants. Um, so try and mint also can grow in. Um, cooler weather. So and, if, uh, and if you live in, in the Daly City area, you could grow uh, cilantro and parsley probably year round there because it doesn't get hot. And, <laughs> yes. And, you know, uh, one good method for growing cilantro is to get a, a, a wide, not necessarily very deep, but a wide pot plant it with cilantro seeds, and then use what they call cut and come again, which means one section at a time of that pot, you would clip and eat that cilantro and then let that section grow back. And so you could have cilantro growing all year round uh, in Daly City. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so yeah, I think Cindy really said it quite well in terms of what you can grow and what you can't grow. Um, I think wind protection is really key in, in Daly City um, in, in, in terms of growing anything. Um, the person also asked about soil and I'm wondering whether any of the panelists have any suggestions. I, 
I'm guessing from the question that the person's going to grow in the native soil there um, as compared to raised beds. I would highly recommend raised beds there. I mean, I'm not an expert on daily city soil, but I'm guessing it's probably not very good. Um, it, so d does anyone have any thoughts on the soil aspect of this question? I think your recommendation for raised beds where you can put in good soil to start with is a, is a good recommendation. I think that's good for everybody. Yes. <laughs> But I think uh, Daly City probably is very rocky um, and has a lot of clay, I would guess. So I would think raised beds would be the way to go. And if you can't build a raised bed, then um, you know large containers will work too for most vegetables. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and then finally, the questioner asked if there was one book you would recommend to a beginner gardener. What would it be? And um, I toss out there our very own Master Gardener Handbook. It has chapters on vegetables. It has uh, fruit trees and avocados. It has general landscape plants. It has soil and mulch. It has um, insects, diseases. It has everything. It has charts and lists of resistant plants. But it gets deep and it gets heavy. And it's, you know, it's not light reading for the most part. But I think. That, other panelists have kind of better ideas, but that's something to consider. And, and you can buy that online from mm -hmm. the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources website. It, and there's probably a link to that in our um, Master Gardener website. Mm -hmm. Or Amazon too. Yes, but I, uh, because we had this question in advance, I'm prepared. <laughs> Here's the Sunset Western Garden book which is a great favorite of most gardeners. Um, it gives you lots of information about lots of different specific plants, but it also has pages, you know, about sort of challenge areas. So for instance, it has a page that talks about plants to grow under oak trees. And many of the suggestions for plants to grow under oak trees might also, that might be a good page to look at for the question about the eucalyptus tree because it also addresses, you want plants that don't need the, the so much water that the water is problematic for the tree and you want plants whose roots can cope with the fact that the tree's already there. So there's a certain amount of crossover even though eucalyptus are sort of a, a really different category from oak trees. Um, but I also have two others I'm going to just suggest. They're both by the same author. For someone who wants more entertaining reading, that's also very, very valuable. We, there's a local author named Pam Pierce, and she is a San Francisco. I'll hold it back here so you can see the whole thing. She's a San Francisco author. Her books are specifically geared to the San Francisco foggy coastal kind of gardening that a large chunk of our two counties needs to under to know about. And she's in entertaining and enjoyable to read. And she has two books. She has this one, which is lots of different, which is all kinds of plants, ornamentals and um, veggies. And then she also has this one, which is more based on food plants. And they're really fabulous resources. This is the recent one, the recent cover. Oh, okay, excellent. <laughs> Maybe we can mention that her last her name is spelled P E I R C E. I think that's great. Pam P E I R C E. Pam Pierce. Yeah. Okay, uh, those are some good recommendations. Thanks, um, Betsy. Do, um, I don't think we have any more advanced questions. Um, so we welcome your questions in the chat, and if we don't have you right now. Uh, then while you think of your questions and enter them, maybe we could just have some master gardener garden chat. Maybe we could start by saying, what is it that you're paying attention to this month in, in the garden? And um, let's start with Cindy Bergdorf on that. Uh, weeds. I'm paying attention to the weeds in my garden <laughs> this month. <laughs> uh, also, um, I'm uh, looking at pruning a lot of my native plants that should be cut back and my salvias and um, some of those so that they're ready to burst into bloom when the warm weather comes along. Uh, what else? I'm getting um, my seeds started 
uh, for growing my vegetable garden. Some of the, uh, some things like tomatoes and peppers take six or eight weeks to be really ready to put out into the garden. So I'm starting those in my window uh, on, a, on a mat. I have a, a hot, hot mat to keep those warm. Um, I'm looking at um, all kinds of um, native uh, plants, seeds uh, that I've got, and I'm getting ready to plant those in my new butterfly garden. Ah, that's very good. Um, Jonathan, what about you? Um, yeah, so just following up on Cindy, um, wintertime is, is pruning season, as, as she said. So um, fruit trees should be pruned um, and perennials um, should be pruned at this time. So that includes all the lavenders, rosemaries, um, it, et cetera. Um, all my pruning is, is done right now. Um, weeding is a great thing to do because the, the rain has made the soil a little softer. You can pull those weeds out. Um, I'm also like Cindy, um, getting ready to start uh, my indoor veggies. Um, um, you know, the, the, the warm weather veggies because they do take, you know, a good eight weeks um, starting indoors. Um, and I'm, um, you know, getting ready to get the, to plant some cool weather crops outdoors. I'm, I'm checking the soil temperature in my raised beds um, for, for people who are vegetable gardeners. Uh, a soil thermometer is a great investment for something like $5. And it tells you when your soil temperature is warm enough for seeds to germinate. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, for some of the cool weather crops like, you know, lettuce, arugula, uh, all the greens, um, they, they can go in when the soil temperature is below 60 and, and germinate. They might take a little longer, but they'd be fine. Jonathan, maybe you can answer this question. Uh, uh, what, what direction does the seed starting window face? I guess somebody was mentioning starting seeds in her window box. Um, so I, I don't, it, Cindy, Cindy answered that about the window. I'll let her answer that. I don't do mine in a window. I mean, they mostly need, need just heat and moisture to start with um, to germinate. Now, once they've germinated, yeah, then they need light, um, but you can fake them with artificial light. Um, so I have mine on a countertop underneath some uh, fluorescent bulbs. Um, one is, is uh, on the cool side of the spectrum, so it's bluish. One is on the red side of the spectrum, so it's warmish and, and uh, plants like sunlight that's that's at those two extremes so i just fake it with artificial light and and i'll let cindy uh, address the window question well um sometimes the seed packets will tell you how long it take to germinate and when they'll be ready to plant out but the plant lists that are on our website will also tell you for example i don't know um tomatoes should be planted in may in my area, April or May. And then you can see that it takes about eight weeks to get there and you just count back and that's when you start the seeds. Other things germinate more quickly and you don't have to start them just yet. Although the ones that will take the colder soil, you may wanna start and have them ready. So you kind of have a succession plan going along as you, as you start them. Uh, we have a few questions regarding uh, the fact that people submitted questions that they didn't see on slides here. Yeah. So uh, let's see, one was a, a streptosolan marmalade bush. I submitted questions. Um, mm. S. Jameson's lichens and yellow leaves. Does that, did anyone huh. Okay, so we didn't see the question and that might be my fault. I know that um, sometimes the questions get forwarded to an account that I have, and I checked it like two days ago. I don't think uh -huh. I checked it yesterday or, or the night before. Uh, so anyway, so watering the marmalade bush butterfly weed on a slope. Um, so can we get Gail um, um, unmuted? 
Or Gail, can we do that? Or where's Gail's picture? Can we get that on? on, uh, on I, I have a picture, but I'm not sure how to get it to. It's showing on my screen, but. We have to look in the chat to see it. Gail, Gail is unmuted. Yeah, okay. I, I Hi, see Gail. it. Hi. There she is. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, sorry for not, not being on the ball here with your question. Is it the question about watering on a slope or were there other issues with those plants? Um, that's actually a separate question from the marmalade bush question. So I, I submitted three questions about plants that have problems. Mm, okay. And I, put, I just put those files into the chat. And then the separate question was just a general watering on a slope question, not to a specific mm, okay. plant. So the marmalade bush, while we, while we see if we can get it up where panelists and others can see it, can you describe the problem with the marmalade bush? Yeah, um, I've had the bush for many years. I don't know how long. It's done really well. Um, I just noticed that it started, it has a lot of what looked to me like lichens. They've started spreading over, you know, many of the branches. And just recently, I noticed that some of the leaves were starting to turn yellow, just, you know, the whole leaf is yellow. Um, but it's still blooming. So I don't know if it has a problem or this is just you know, an aging plant or what. Uh, so is this the first time that the leaves have turned yellow like this? Um, I can't say for sure that it's the first time. They might have turned yellow in the last few years when I wasn't paying attention. So um, again, this that issue of yellow leaves is like having a fever. It tells you there's something going on, but it doesn't give you any other clues. <laughs> Uh, one thing you might check is, you know, you, you know the light that it gets, you know the water that it gets, uh, but you can't really tell what's going on underground. So sometimes what's going on is happening under there. Um, check the roots, dig, a, dig a little bit around the roots, see if they look white and strong and healthy as opposed to withered and blackish, brownish. Um, and if it, if it might just be some temporary thing, with the with the with the light, if you haven't changed, like I think it was Betsy pointed out earlier, what has changed in that plant? Um, sometimes plants do get yellow leaves because because there was a bunch of water at one time and they got a little flooded, or other other reasons too. Anybody um, really familiar with the marmalade bush and what its issues might be? Mm -mm. Okay, so it, I would say it, it might be, I don't think it's a sign of aging. The, the lichen won't be affecting it. So I, as long as it is lichen uh, and not uh, a fungus, which would be different. If it's a fungus, it might very well be affecting it. But are, so, there, are there shrubs around it? Um, no, not really. It's no. the closest thing is um, a Mexican sage. Hmm. There, there's a little retaining wall that kind of separates this bush. Um, the only recent thing that happened is that my neighbor replaced his entire fence, which is right around this bush. Hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe the construction did something. That's um, very true. It might have okay. cut. It might have cut through some of those uh, roots. In which case, you if if you have other good roots, it might very well just recover from that over time. Uh huh. So how can I tell if what um, I think our lichens are actually lichens. I, I've, I sent a picture about that. Um, maybe someone can look at it later. Um, yeah, if you send us photos, you can always send photos to the helpline. Mm -hmm. That You don't have to wait for us to have another online clinic for that. You can always send photos to the helpline. And then the volunteers who are um, working at the helpline can look at the photos and tell you. Uh, you can also go online and just look for photos of lichen and see if you can find something that looks kind of like it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, is it, do you think it's moss maybe? I'm not, I am not sure I know the difference between moss and lichens. Lichen well, seems dry. Moss seems green and moist. You think you describe will, it as something that seems will, dry? Moss will appear if they're not if it, the plant is not getting enough light. And moss is green, and lichen typically is not green. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, I don't think lichen is ever really green, maybe the palest possible green. Yeah. Okay. Um, you uh, say St. Jameson's lichens. Is that what you had I, um, preliminarily identified as the lichen on the plant? That's a question to me. Yes. Um, I, I just um, know that I don't know what, if it's lichens, I don't know what t um, okay. type they are. It's just I, the scientific name for the, um, the plant is Streptosol and Jamesonii. That's oh, okay. what I put in. So <laughs> marmalade bush. But yeah, I'll look at them and see if they see, seem dry or green. Okay. Um, then you had a question on butterfly weed? Yes. And what's your question? Oh, um, I also sent a picture. Um, the leaves were getting discolored. Um, they were sort of kind of a dirtyish yellow and had spots on them. Um, that that isn't un, that isn't untypical for that plant this time of year. They get a little tatty looking. Is it just sort of a tatty looking thing as opposed to some glaring issue with the leaves? Yeah, it just looks sort of yeah yucky. <laughs> yeah. Would, you, would other panelists agree that this time of year, those butterfly uh, bushes can look pretty tatty? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, and you can always um, prune it back a little bit too. That might help it. That's what yeah, I, I, I really, I really prune back quite hard on my butterfly bushes uh, during the winter and mm -hmm. they go, they grow back just fine. Um, they're really hardy and they're, and they're really prolific during the summer. So yeah, just cut them back to the woody, to the woody stem, cut off mm -hmm. all the foliage. Yeah, I started doing that. And I noticed that some leaves were sprouting, sprouting back on what looked like dead stems. So I'll just, I have two of them. I'll just whack them back quite a bit yeah. and see what happens. Yeah, that's a good, a good, a good management issue for those plants. <laughs> yeah, if, don't, if don't you don't whack them back, you will not have a butterfly bush. You'll have a butterfly tree. Yeah, and then <laughs> you won't be able to see any butterflies that land on them because they'll be thirty feet above your head. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I, I would. You, you know, you, I would do not be afraid to be aggressive <laughs> with okay. with a butterfly bush. It can stand it just fine. Okay, good to know, because I, I can't have trees where these things are planted. So. Okay, and what and uh, in terms of watering on a slope, uh, tell us about that. Um, so my backyard slopes, uh, I live in San Francisco and I have a small yard, so it, it slopes um, and you know, I have all sorts of things planted and I'm just wondering, and I also have a drip system, so I'm just wondering if what I think is getting sufficient water at the top of the slope isn't actually because the water is all flowing downhill and that the things that are closer to the bottom of the hill are getting overwatered. Well, first, I, I guess one thing is to look at the plants. Does the ones on the bottom seem like they're thriving? If so, then I don't worry about them. And the ones on the top, depending on what you've planted, they might be getting what they need, which is quickly draining uh, soil and that would be good for them. Um, but if it looks like they have a problem, then you might want to do something like basins or a little mini terrace around that plant. Um, does anybody have um, other suggestions on that? I would build a, a little terrace around it too. Um, and if your if your drip is um, in sections, you might run that section maybe at extra time during the week at the top, just to make sure those plants are getting enough water. Okay, um, so it's all one drip system. So if if I'm thinking of planting something and it says needs well draining soil, could I assume that the upper part of this this uh, slope? might qualify as well-draining soil, but the bottom certainly would not. I think that those are reasonable assumptions, if not like literally down to in every detail. That mm -hmm. would be a good starting point, saying that would be my baseline thing to look at. And fast-draining soil, I don't know if, they, if there's a difference between well-draining and fast-draining, <laughs> probably the same. But yeah, I would eliminate something that didn't say needs fast-draining, well-draining soil from putting it at the top. Okay. Yeah. I mean, from putting at the bottom. At the bottom. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Okay, Gail, I'm, I apologize again. That's okay. I think that probably was, you know, I should have like hmm. checked later. And we also have uh, Tomoko Flynn. Right, submitted, well, you see that questions about three fruit trees. Okay, so um, can we put Tomoko on? Tomoko, are you here? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi Tomoko. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> um, I have three fruits trees. One is a mayor lemon, about eight years old, and other two are a dwarf plum and a fig. And they're not fruiting well at all. Uh, Maya lemon um, gets flowers, but uh, it doesn't become a fruit. Um, dwarf plum also blooms a little bit, but uh, it, it yielded one fruit like the, the first year or the second year. Um, I, it's, it's, they are planted on facing east side and uh, next to the fence and the next door has tall camaria tree blocks the sun. So it doesn't get a lot of sun, but uh, half of the day it does get um, light and sun. I am not uh, good at giving fertilizers. Um, that may be one of the reasons, but if there's any suggestions, I should try. Uh, where do you live? San Francisco. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's um, the problem. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much sun you get in what section of San Francisco you live in, but most of the areas in San Francisco are not known to be good for uh, fruit trees and citrus and things like that that like it warm, very warm. Okay. Yeah, especially in a situation where they're not getting um, enough nutrients. Seven or eight hours of solid yeah. sunshine a day. The, the citrus needs seven or eight hours of sunshine a day. So, and I think that people have had success with Meyer lemons in San Francisco. It's one of the ones that Pam Pierce uh, suggests you're more likely to have success with Meyer lemons and kumquats than with other kinds of citrus in San Francisco. But, um, but it still has to have seven or eight hours of sun. So if it's being shaded out by a tree for part of the day, it's gonna have a very hard time. Uh, yeah. I, I, even though, well, 80 years sounds pretty old for a Meyer lemon to me, but it might also be that it's just that the conditions have gradually deteriorated that the tree um, is operating under. And so it's just, it's getting struggling, it's struggling and getting harder and harder for it to actually produce fruit. I, I see. Um, uh, the leaves are growing, the branches are growing. So I constantly trimming um, oh no no that um that may be part of the problem you may be cutting off the fruiting the flowering parts of the branches okay all right looks like i need to learn a lot more and <laughs> possibly yeah um, <laughs> um move to a sunny area yeah which... citrus trees like they they grow down so okay. the branches come out and eventually they kind of cascade so you may need to prune the branches underneath as they kind of die because they don't get enough sun. But um, the, the flowering is on the very, very end of each one of those branches. And if you're pruning it a lot, you're probably pruning off the, the, the new flowers and therefore the fruit. I see, that may be <laughs> the major reason. Yeah. Here's one additional question I have. Okay. I, a month ago, I purchased a Nagami kumquat tree, and which has like 20 um, yellow fruits already on. And I was debating whether I should plant on the ground. Um, I do have a small sunny spot, I was thinking, but, but then I wasn't successful for other trees. I was 
wondering whether I should keep it in, in, in a pot. But uh, one of you mentioned that kumquat requires repotting every two to three years. So now, now I, I think it better to plant on the ground. Um, other than sun, sun, what else do you, do you advise if I plant on the ground? So I'm going to jump in here. You said that you have not had success with a few other trees that you've tried to plant. Did I hear yes. that correctly? Yes. So I'm, there is a, there is a, when you plant a tree, it's very, very important not to plant it too deep in the soil, not to plant it too low in the ground. The place right where the trunk transitions yes. to the roots, that where it has that little curve out, yes. that should be up above the soil level by just a little bit. So you can actually see that flare out and it's not down that flare out is not down below the soil because that part of the tree trunk right where it changes into roots is needs a lot of oxygen and if it's buried under the soil or has a lot of mulch mounded up around it it can't get enough oxygen um, so that is a, a surprisingly common mistake people aren't given enough good information about that so that's one thing i would say is when you plant your um, kumquat in the ground make sure you find a good diagram or some good information that helps you understand how to locate it so you're not planting it too deep. Um, and also how to understand how to prepare the hole uh, in the way that will give the tree the best chance of surviving. That would be one consideration. Okay, great. Thank you, Tomoko, for, for the interesting questions. Um, so Monica, do we have other? Yes, we have several others, and this has to do with which side of the garden to put his, uh, the raised beds in. Uh, the backyard faces north with fences on the east and west. What are you going to be growing? This is Gayathi. Gayathri. Uh. Yeah, Gayathri, can you unmute yourself? Or be unmuted if you're there? Maybe we should... Um... Yeah, hang on just so I'm struggling with my headset. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is what you're planting. Oh, now, she, now yeah. she's muted again. You're muted again now. There we go. There we go. Okay. So are you thinking about planting vegetables or ornamentals or what did you have in mind? Hmm. Well, maybe we could just answer theoretically. I think so. So uh, I'll just I'll just I'll just jump in. I mean, assuming that she wants to grow vegetables, um, you you generally want to want it to get good uh, afternoon sun, which means um, coming from the southwest. Um, so you know, positioning it more on the east side, um, if you can, to expose it to that um, western sun. Um, but you have to look for um, things that are going to block the sunlight, like trees and houses and fences and, and so forth. So um, I replied in the chat window to Gaia 3, you know, with some suggestions about just, you know, going out in the yard, tracking the sun during the day, um, and also uh, using the NOAA solar calculator, which all the master gardeners uh, are very familiar with um, to see where the sun is at different times of the day, at different times of the year. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the last point is make sure you got water nearby. <laughs> and we got, a, we got a thumbs up on that. Yeah, the location is really important. Um, you have to understand your sun. Um, 
if you, you know, have to have something, but you don't have the right requirements, it won't survive. It won't thrive. So it, it is very important to understand, you know, what kind of sun you have and where. Okay. Great. Here's another tree question. Are we ready for it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. My 20-year-old Chinese pistache had significantly less foliage last year, but tons of berries. It's in full sun, no recent changes other than continued drought. What could be happening? Well, sometimes things that are under stress um, will produce more seeds trying to reproduce themselves um, if, they, if they're in a dire need um, uh, place. I don't know that that's what's happening to her plant. Um, if it's got some issues and it's trying to, it's making a lot of seeds um, in order to survive through the seedlings, um, it's hard to know. I don't know if anyone else has an opinion. Uh, this, uh, my flowering, um, I'll see, I, they're flowering cherries, I think. Anyway, um, I, I've had them in the ground for 30 years. Beautiful blossoms, never had any seeds whatsoever. This last fall, we had a huge crop of these little berries all over the ground. And mm. I think the biggest change it's not been overnight, but it's been 30 years is that the oak trees that are behind them have grown bigger and bigger and shade them more and more. And I think those trees are under um, stress. And that, that's why I'm, I'm getting that reaction too. Mm -hmm. So can the questioner um, speak? That's Lynn. Lynn, would you like to unmute? Hi. Hi, Lynn. So are there stresses that, that uh, other than the drought, which is a stress for sure, uh, that maybe you have more competition for that lower amount of water or something else? Do you, you have um, any thoughts on the stress? Yeah, it's in full sun. There's nothing shading it. It's next to a deck. It, it has some ivy and agapanthus planted near it and some stepping stones that walk by it. Otherwise, there's really nothing that's changed. Those agapanthus roots can be very aggressive and they can go deep, they can go round and they can wrap around and they'll be establishing themselves. They will compete with water for it. So um, wherever, the aga, wherever the agapanthus are, the, the roots are, are much farther away from it than you would guess. Yeah, um, yeah, there's one kind of large patch of agapanthus about two feet from the trunk, but that's only in one area. It's probably about a two foot diameter agapanthus, but that could possibly be it. I don't think the, um, would the uh, ivy be that competitive with it? The ivy would also compete with it, yes. Yeah. Okay. The ivy isn't growing on it, is it? No. No, we cut it off. Yeah. Okay, so maybe clear out some of the competing plants then. Yeah, if nothing else has changed, and if you think the drought is contributing it, it wouldn't hurt to soak, soak the area a little bit either. But yeah, check, check a, take it, try one of those agapanthus that's close to it and try and get as many of the roots as you can. Just see how far those roots have gone. Um, they're... <laughs> <laughs> they can really make an aggressive mat of roots. It's surprising. These are, this is a big bunch of agapanthus. It's oh, well, been there, there for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I'll try that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and also I'm just going to say that a lot of people don't realize that we've actually had a couple of years of pretty low water. And mm -hmm. it doesn't yet feel like, it doesn't yet feel feel like that somehow because we have been getting spells of rain but overall you know all the plants all the trees are getting a little bit less water than they're used to right now over the last couple of years so uh, actually um the last two that. this year and last year were the were the third um uh less rain years since 1859 yeah. yeah, and I think for, people, for it doesn't feel season. like, it's not as obvious as it was right. 
the last big drought cycle we had. And so I think people are not as aware of that as um, they were the last big, you know, four or five year drought cycle that we had a few years ago. I think our and trees really suffer through dr in drought. I know I've lost several trees and I know it's due to drought. Um, they're old trees that the roots are deep. They depend on the groundwater and it's just not there. So. And I think as master gardeners, we have to say, you know, you, you sacrifice the small plants, save the trees. You know, they do so much ecological work. They're so important. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, ag <laughs> that agapanthus. <laughs> I guess How as a professional really gardener, I'm always it, dealing with agapanthus. <laughs> Okay, uh, other questions. New question from this one from Terry. Do you have thoughts about buying new plants from growers or nurseries that may have been pre-treated with insecticides? Are they safe for bees? Generally, yep. no, they are not safe for bees. And that's one of the reasons I grow a lot of my plants uh, from seed, or I try to buy them from somebody who does not spray um, there are uh, nurseries and growers that do not spray. Uh, I, I happen to have three beehives, so I'm very sensitive to uh, what I use in my yard, um, but I hope my neighbors are too. I, I, um, years ago, I used to spray like my roses with horticulture oil and, um, you know, and use systemic uh, stuff and all that stuff. And then I quit doing it. I quit spraying everything. Um, I don't spray anything. I don't use, I just use a little fertilizer occasionally. And I was amazed at the amount of insects that appeared in my garden. Um, once the garden became healthy again, um, like in the spring, um, when the aphids land on my roses, I have soldier beetle insects they devour, I, you know, in a week they're gone. Um, so I never, I don't have the need for uh, sprays and insecticides because I have the natural insect in my garden. And um, it's really wonderful, it's wonderful to watch. So, so if you buy a plant that was pre-treated and you bring it now, let's say you don't have beehives, but you're still concerned, uh, will, will any linger, how long will lingering toxic effects last? Sometimes it'll last forever. It doesn't go away at all. If it, it depends on what was sprayed on them. If it was a systemic, then it's in the it's in the plant roots, it's in the plant leaves, it's in the plant, you know, stems. It's it's in all of it. Terry added that she forgot to add, she or he, sorry, that I learned all citrus trees and plants are pre-treated uh, before sale in California. Is that true? Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Oh, I, I honestly don't know when you go to a nursery to buy plants from them. I don't know if there's a, an, a, an easy way to tell whether the plants that you're buying from the nursery have been pre-treated. And the nursery might not know either. Correct. Or at least the people you talk to there may not know. Mm -hmm. Well, we do know that at least in my area, uh, some of the growers are uh, the, that they buy up from a lot are Monrovia and Annie's. So, do we know if those sources pre-treat? That's you know, this is a good question. I hadn't really thought about it. I think Monrovia does. I don't Mon know about Annie's. Mon Monrovia does, and Annie's does on anything that they ship. So, if you buy plants from that get shipped to you, that those have been sprayed. Mm. Mm. So how do you learn that? That's that's a new question for me. Well, when, when I'm buying plants, uh, particularly uh, natives and things that I buy from um, nurseries outside of the area, I go to their website first and look to see what it says. And then if I don't see anything, then I send them a question and I ask them specifically, do you spray? And if so, what do you spray with? Okay. Well, that's good. That's, thanks for that great question. <laughs> I think that can benefit us all. Mm -hmm. Because I know one thing we've learned over time is that if you don't have um, if you don't have some pest insects, you don't get beneficial insects. If you don't have insects in your yard, pretty soon you won't have birds in your yard. The birds need insects, you know, mm -hmm. to successfully breed and 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 thrive. And we need our birds. So yeah. 
And I'll, I'll put in a plug too for hummingbirds. 80% um, of the diet of a hummingbird is protein. It's mm -hmm. spiders, it's insects of all kinds, gnats, uh, all kinds of things in your garden. Um, yes, they like nectar, but they need protein. So they need those spiders and insects in order to be able to survive and to feed their young. Mm -hmm. okay. I think people think they live on sugar water sometimes. Yeah, yeah well, they don't. They, do. they live on drugs. <laughs> yes. That's great. Okay, Monica, do we have any others? Uh, do the soil moisture tools that you can get at places like SLOAT work for testing the water condition of soil around plants? They do have monitors that, you know, multifunction ones, they'll show the alkaline acidic uh, range. They'll show uh, the, the moisture level. Is it, is it dry, moist, or soaked, which is handy, but you want to, you want to buy an ex the more expensive tool because sometimes they're unreliable. And sometimes really just to, uh, to do, um, I always carry with me a, like a, um, what do you call a sticks like through a little teriyaki thing? A dowel, like a chopstick or a dowel. Yeah, yeah, just a thin skinny thing that goes into even hard soil. And just to kind of stick that in, you can get it in about six, seven inches. Uh, and that's a good, a good, a good layer. You wanna be um, thinking about watering when the top two to three inches are dry and some plants even the top inch and a half to two inches. So that'll tell you when you pull it back out at what level the soil is clinging around indicating dampness. And that can, if you just walk around with one of those um, skewer sticks, that's what I was thinking oh, yeah. of. A skewer okay. stick, they're easy to put in the ground. They're, you know, they're easy to come by and they're a good little monitor, but they won't tell you the alkalinity or those other things that the, that the moisture monitors do. I use my index finger to see well, what the moisture is like. <laughs> That's right. That's around right. a little. <laughs> yeah. One, one of the things that I learned early on when I first uh, started, when I first became a master gardener and started taking classes and learning from other master gardeners is that um, many people who, there are several people who really like those moisture meters, but most of the people who like them have learned that they are a, a relative m measurement. So in order to know how to use your moisture monitor, you have to play with it a little bit and like have a flower pot or some soil that is just the right moisture you like, then use your moisture monitor and make a mark of where that moisture monitor says it is because that's gonna tell, and then, then you learn more relative to if the needle goes down or up from there. But the moisture, the markings on the moisture monitor itself may not be, as accurate as you want. So it's more useful if you, if you essentially calibrate it yourself based on your own experience of how much moisture is in the soil at the time that you're testing it. Oh, and that reminds me, Betsy, of something else. Um, you need to have that tip really pristine clean. I keep in my pocket, like um, at the hardware store, you can buy this uh, material that you can just kind of sand off paint with and, and it's very good for like getting a little rust off of your pruners, but it's also good just to take one quick little twist at the end of that tip. And then it's ready to do the another moisture again or else your result will be a little skewed by the buildup of soil and dirt on the tip. Okay, we have another question. My Virginia's leaves seem to die more than they should. Is it the bottom leaves or the top leaves? This is Lynn. Lynn, because I have these plants in my garden and the bottom leaves do die in the winter there. Right now there's a lot of brown leaves, but the top leaves are all nice and green and fresh and, and yeah, that's where the plant grows. Here she they, is. They, um, they're planted next to the decorative asparagus. They kind of are the spiky upwards ones. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, um, it, yeah, it seems to be the older, close to the base leaves, and yeah, that does get the new growth. Plant. But I wonder if the asparagus roots are inner, which are pretty um, tenacious, are interfering with the Virginia. Virginia is pretty, <laughs> pretty good too. They're pretty yeah. hardy. You can see big, huge beds of Virginia, and it, they're so thick. 
you know, I can't think that they're real sense, you know, that their roots, I think, could hold their own. Okay. <laughs> and most of the plant is above ground anyway, I think. Um, it can create a, a pretty good uh, uh, rhizome above um, the ground where the, where the growth grows out of. Right. Um, so, and they interconnect underneath and they're pretty hardy. But I wouldn't worry about the older leaves dying. Um, okay. That's just normal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So one question about that is to take off or not to take off those, those big paddle shaped dark leaves. Uh, at first I was always taking them off, but then I thought, no, because the plant's just getting bigger and bigger and there's more and more of that rhizomic sort of stem sitting there. So now I sort of leave them and they make a little platform <laughs> for the green leaves to sort of rest on. Mm -hmm. I just take mine and chop them off and put them in the ground and they grow um, when they get too tall. That's a good idea. Um, they're pretty hardy. I mean, <laughs> you know, they went out of fashion for a while, but I, I really like the Virginia. Yeah, I just grab a piece off the plant and give it to people and tell them to put it in the ground and it, it works. So, and right now they look really pretty in the winter. They're a winter bloomer. So they look, they're very nice in the garden. They add some color right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's two kinds. Which 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 kind do you have, Cynthia, Cindy? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what type it is. It's um, pink. <laughs> yeah, they have pink. One of them blooms more in the heart of winter. The other one closer to spring. And one. I'm blooming now. Full bloom. And one, one leaves turn sort of reddish in the winter. No, I don't have that one. Okay, that you got the what they call the pig squeak. I, I like that one better too. Time. There, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to live in Humboldt County and, and, they, and you know, the Virginias, are, they just grow wild there, really. Yeah, and they keep growing up. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? No more questions. Okay, does any, any of the panelists have something they'd like to add, a particular note or word of wisdom or please don't forget, et cetera? Um, I'm just gonna say that for those of you who like me love camellias, this is a great time of year to plant new camellia plants. Um, one of the most counterintuitive things about camellias is that when at this time of year, when they are blooming, that's when they're dormant. That just is so backwards to me. It's completely the opposite of the way roses work, but it's, that's the way camellias work. So this is the time of year when you can see what the blossoms actually look like when you go to look at the plants in the nursery. And it's a really good time to plant them, but don't plant them too deep. <laughs> that's great a, advice. Uh, and I have a question about camellias. I have some camellias that are probably 70 years old mm -hmm. and they're quite large. Mm -hmm. And um, I feed them, but I, all, all, I often wonder if I, it does any good to feed them um, since they're so old. Um, what is your opinion about uh, you know, feeding them? So should I do it or shouldn't I do it? I, for the most part, Camellias are shallow rooted plants. And so there is value, even when they're very old, there is occasionally a camellia will develop one big deep tap root that's like an anchor root, but it's not the root that's feeding it. The, mm -hmm. the roots that are actively feeding the plant and taking care of the plant are pretty close to the surface. So I think there is value in giving them cotton seed meal at least. Yes, um, I do that. And uh, I think that's that's a, a useful and valuable thing to do, or just make sure that you like give them. They like some. They like leaf mold. They like compost that keeps the soil a little bit acidic. They want the soil to be a little acidic, mm -hmm. and you don't want to mount it up right against the trunk. You want to keep a little bit of airspace around the trunk, but keeping leaf mold around on the soil under them that's not right up against the trunk helps keep the soil soft and spongy and those surface roots need that, they need the loose, soft, spongy soil to be able to, to take okay, advantage I'll do of some compost it. and see how that, and cut and yeah. see. Yeah, because just remember, most of the important activity is not down deep. It's not a deep, deep taproot kind of thing. It's, it's mostly roots that are fair within the first 
you know, the so top foot or so of the soil. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're about running out of time, but we can say that our next plant clinic will be May 2nd, same as same time, on Sunday. Um, and next slide, please. And we would like to acknowledge the San Mateo Arboretum Society, although we're not able to be there and meet you in person with your plant specimens and questions, uh, they're still supportive. So a big shout out to they do a great job there. Uh, and also all the people who have helped us put this together, our back staff that you're really not seeing, but have put in a lot of work and the master gardeners who give us their knowledge. Um, and then all of you questioners, thank you so much for making it a really interesting event. Uh, and next slide. This, uh, this is that we've been talking about helpline. We do have a way to help, help you like on the spot. You can call the helpline. You can email them with your pictures. And they're very good at getting back to people with uh, detailed answers. And you can set up a dialogue. And uh, so I, I encourage you to go and call them or email them. And our website has lots of fantastic links, whether it's fruit trees or citrus trees or ornamentals or um, insects, beneficial and less beneficial, uh, all kinds of things. So enjoy all these resources that the, uh, that the University of Davis makes available to you and all the public. And thank you for joining us. We, um, I certainly enjoyed this session and, and, and I can see by the smile of the other panelists, it's been great. So happy gardening and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Just us chickens. Just us chickens. I put everybody, there's one person in the waiting room, but he'll get out. So um, he, he I think, yeah, he joined with his partner spouse. Okay, so I can see that I dropped the ball. I thought that I'd gotten all the questions, but clearly, well, if it was, I'll have to check, no, you know, but it seems like the most likely thing is that those questions came to, to my email and I did, like I said, I didn't check it at all yesterday or later Friday evening. Do they might have also gone to the helpline. That's mm -hmm. true, yeah. Do you and, want this to still be recording? Oh, 